the virtual roundtable series, Mainstreaming Knowledge on Aging. It is my pleasure to join you uh, today. As you know, aging and the human rights of older persons have been addressed for many decades in the international arena, mainly at the UN General Assembly and its third committee, together with the open-ended working group on aging in New York. Likewise, it is part of the topics covered by the UN Human Rights Council and its Universal Periodic Review. In these scenarios, some significant achievements have been made and others are in process. In this regard, the second event entitled Two Worlds, Same Goal, ongoing efforts at the UN General Assembly and the UN Human Rights Council um, for the rights of older persons will be the opportunity to exchange information from New York and Geneva on the status, developments and possibilities to complement and align further efforts. We are going to start with um, His Excellency Ambassador Luis Gallegos, former Minister of the Republic, a Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Ecuador. He's currently UNITAR's Chair of the Board of Trustees, President of the Global Initiative on Aging Foundation, and Fellow on Human Rights and Equity in Harvard. Among other distinguished uh, appointments, His Excellency has been permanent representative to the UN in New York and Geneva. Therefore, he is well aware of the dynamics on the topic uh, in these scenarios. He was also the president of the committee that drafted uh, the UN's Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. Excellency, please, you have the floor. Uh, can you hear me now? Because I was muted by you. Oh. Uh, thank you very much, Ana Lucia. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on what part of the world you are at at this moment. Uh, I have the honor to welcome you all to the second event of the virtual roundtable series, Mainstreaming Knowledge on Aging, Bridging Paths Towards Strengthening Protection and Participation. UNITAR and its 24 international training centers for authorities and leaders, UNDESA, UNFPA, IOM, UN Women, UNHCR, WHO, ITU, and WHCHR, together with a group of state friends of older persons in New York, the group of state friends of the human rights of older persons in Geneva, the International Network for the Prevention of Elders Abuses, the International Longevity Center, the Global Initiative on Aging Foundation, have uh, joint efforts to prepare this initiative. The capacity building opportunities aim to include different stakeholders to learn from, uh, from some good practices and challenges on aging, as well as the protection and participation of older persons from a comprehensive perspective. The discussions in the framework of these mutually complementary and enriching discussions are envisioned as a basis of, to take stock on existing and upcoming efforts to strengthen further synergies, as well as engaging different actors, including from New York and Geneva, as the core scenarios of formal discussions on the top. We strongly believe that raising awareness of aging, as well as the strengths and challenges of older persons pursue, pursues the elimination or the less mitigation, or at less mitigation of discriminatory social institutions, laws, cultural norms, and community practices, such as those limiting the promotion and protection of human rights and sustainable development. Ladies and gentlemen, we shall all be aware and accept that aging is a natural process. Sooner or later, we will all exercise older age by, by first hand or because one of our relative friends and colleagues are already are getting close to the stage of life. In my case, I am a person of 75 years old, so I am included in this group. A very, I'm very honored so. In light of the intensifying pace of global population aging, aging, it is important to underline the human rights of older persons from a proactive role where they are the main actors of their own destinies. In the current context, while the pandemic has made visible and deepened the challenges in the inclusion and full participation of this group, it also represents an opportunity when it comes to establishing short, medium, and long-term measures. In this regard, the role of different local and national mechanisms is paramount. Likewise, while this worldwide challenge seems to have painted a bleak picture 
The perseverance and resilience of older persons is commendable. Their role in society has been highlighted not only as part of the frontline health workforce, but also as caretakers for their grandchildren during school closures, as a source of courage and patience in coping with the pandemic. Therefore, fostering equal and adequate conditions for the development of their autonomous independent life as needed represents an essential step forward toward their integral protection and participation. It is important to raise awareness on the potential and challenges of this group in the social, economic, political, and cultural aspects to, to the empowerment and visibility of their rights. The experience and contribution of older persons have in our communities placed them in a strategic position for the design and implementation of public policies and programs. In this endeavor, it is quite relevant the inclusion of older persons not only as beneficiaries of capacity building activities, but also as speakers, but also as speakers or trainers from their experience on a wide range of topics addressed to different profiles. To this end, the UN Decade of Healthy Aging, as well as the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development represented, represents an important motivation for our partnership to keep reinforcing capacities as a powerful source toward the transforming lives of individuals and society. Finally, we shall never forget that people should age healthy, active, free of anguish and with dignity. I wish you and the excellent continuation, uh, an excellent continuation and all the best in the promotion and protection of the rights of older persons. I thank all the participants on the panel and welcome all the audiences worldwide. Thank you very much for your presence this morning. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Now it's a pleasure to introduce your moderator, Mr. Alex Mejia, the Director of the Division for People and Social Inclusion at UNITER. Mr. Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ana Lucia. Thank you to the distinguished uh, panelists and uh, thank you above uh, everything. Any, anyone, excuse me, to the participants that join us today. Um, I uh, simply wanted to join my voice to that of Ambassador Gallegos, the president of the chairman of the board of trustees of UNITAR, to thank uh, all of you on behalf of UNITAR. UNITAR is very pleased to be supporting the decade of healthy aging. And in this particular uh, case, in, according to the mandate of our organization to strengthen the capacity to make the decade of healthy aging a success. Now, uh, as we have started the proceedings already uh, listening to Ambassador Gallegos, um, I would like now to offer uh, the floor to Dr. <coughs> Claudia Mahler and to uh, properly introduce her. Dr. Claudia Mahler is the UN independent expert on the full enjoyment of the human rights by older persons. Dr. Mahler was appointed by the UN Human Rights Council as independent expert on the enjoyment of all human rights by older persons in May 2020. She has been a senior researcher in the field of economic, social, and cultural rights at the German Institute for Human Rights since 2010. Over the last 20 years, she has also worked as a lecturer in the field of human rights law in different academic institutions in both Germany and Austria. Since the establishment of the independent experts mandate by the Human Rights Council in 2013, the role has been assessing the implementation of national, regional and international standards relevant to the rights of older persons and identified the exchange and promoted best practices relating to the promotion and protection of these rights. The mandate has also included reports and raising awareness initiatives on the challenges faced in the realization of the human rights of older persons by regular engaging in dialogue, dialogue and consulting with states and other relevant stakeholders. It is a great pleasure for UNITAR to welcome Dr. Claudia Muller, the UN independent expert on the full enjoyment of the human rights by older persons. You have the floor, Dr. Muller. Welcome. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Alex. I'm really honored to be here with you today. Also, thank you very much to UNITAR for this wonderful contribution to raising awareness to older persons. I think it's a perfect initiative to bring us all together on the same table. And today's topic is really key, to link New York and Geneva. And to be honest, I always think as if I'm the personal link 
because my mandate is based in Geneva, but I'm also working in New York. I report in New York and I'm part of the open-ended working group. So feel free to contact me as the personal link if you want to learn more about this. Please allow me to share my screen with you. I did a couple of slides. I hope it works now. Uh, do you see it? Does it work? Okay. Yes, we can see it. Thank you so much. As I already said, I still feel uh, that I'm the personal link between New York and Geneva, and I will try to give you an update in a nutshell. It is more or less a decade we are working on these issues now in the open and in the UN Open Ended Working Group on Aging. It was set up in 2010, and we had the last April the 12th session. So there is a lot of material out there and a lot of discussion have been happened. We discussed, for example, care, autonomous living, and also the part, the positive contribution and participation of older persons to the SDGs, for example. So you see there is a broad range of topic which have already been tackled in New York. But this Dynamics are a little bit different in New York. We all know this, that uh, the General Assembly does not really focus on the human rights perspective. So we need also to bring the human rights perspective to the table of the open-ended working group in aging and link the specialists in Geneva with the work we are doing in New York. From my perspective, I see that the open-ended working group uh, on aging already achieved some, some positive implications to bring more awareness to the topic of older persons. The last development we have witnessed in New York is that now there is a cross-regional core group which is working on the topic of older persons to get a stronger voice to the General Assembly and the UN in large. What will I propose in this regard? We also should take into account what the Office of the High Commissioner has already done. For example, there is a report on um, environment discussion. There was a specific report on older persons and the gaps. And there are many specific reports from the mandate, which were already kindly mentioned by Ambassador Gallegos. And I think it is really good also to focus on the intersectionalities, which I tried to raise, especially in New York, for example, with my last report on gender and age. So older women are in the focus of this report. And I think there are a couple of recommendations which are useful for discussions on older women, for example, or gender issues. In Geneva, we do have discussions in the Human Rights Council and we should take care what kind of um, resolutions are there already in the making. For example, uh, we discussed this year in the last session, the um, resolution on uh, IDPs and older persons are not really mentioned very often in the case of IDPs but right now we have seen because of the current crisis in Ukraine that there are a lot of older persons which are still in the country and which had to flee so please also allow me to raise awareness in this regard that we should try to also include all the persons in the work which is already already happening. I try to do this also with my reports as mentioned, and I'm lucky to may uh, conduct more country missions, which allow me to have more close discussions with governments on the ground level and get uh, firsthand information on good examples and what, what works perfect. We do have a group of friends in Geneva. We do have a group of friends in New York, and I would suggest that there should also be joint meetings to discuss how the fruitful discussions in both fora could, uh, could um, get more um, information from the different settings. 
What else can I say? Uh, I was very happy that last year we had the substantive resolution based on the language also from my report on ageism and age discrimination, which was set up uh, and had a lot of agreement uh, last year. And I'm really happy and I'm looking forward to get more substantive resolutions in Geneva. I'm sure that a couple of others will also tackle the issue of the stakeholder meeting in Geneva and how we better also can connect um, the two fora. What can be done? We know there are different environments in the discussions in New York and at the Human Rights Council, but we also know that this is an ongoing process. What can we, how can we also reach out to other constituencies? For example, the high level political panel. We can try to include, for example, all the women to this year's SDG discussion and make sure that there are indicators which also take into account what are what older persons can contribute or where are they left behind. We can include more side events where older persons should speak because they are the ones, as already was stated, which have the knowledge what they need on the ground. And also the inclusion of all the persons in our common agenda would be one of our yeah, goals from both sides, from Geneva and New York. I also was thinking, as I said before, it would be good to think about a renewal resolution, how we can mainstream older persons in this regard. For example, on climate change, older persons are very often not taking into account because it's more a uh, a discussion on future generations, but we also have to realize that there are future generations of older persons. It's not just about youth or, or per older persons, it's the whole life cycle. So we really need to take, must take into account that there are new generations of older persons. And as uh, Ambassador Khaled has already said, we are working also for all our future, hopefully, that we can, uh, have a good human rights based approach in this regard. It's not my phone, sorry. Um, but what can we do in this regard more is, oh, it is actually my phone, but it was just a timer to tell me that I'm running out of time. So I will come to my conclusions. Um, let's think of the event, how we can raise more awareness in other constituencies that older persons are not left behind. I think our common goal should be a comprehensive human rights treaty to fully protect the human rights of older persons. I thank you for your attention. And I'm sorry for the phone. That, that is uh, perfectly all right, uh, we thank uh, Dr. Claudia Mahler uh, for uh, such a comprehensive uh, overview of what is needed. Uh, thank you very, very much uh, to you as the UN Independent Expert on the full enjoyment of human rights by older persons. With that keynote speech, which is very suited for what we want to accomplish next, let me now open the panel proper. I'll be uh, very pleased to moderate the uh, following speakers. Um, but first, uh, let me also give you a point of order, if I may. We will have your presentation ready. We will, um, you will use the time allotted. And uh, at the end, if there is enough time, we would like, of course, uh, to have questions and answers. To have you today, dear esteemed uh, panelists, is quite unique to assemble a group like you. So we are very pleased at any order. And without further ado, I would like to um, announce Her Excellency Ambassador Paula Narvaez Ojeda, the permanent representative of Chile to the United Nations and other international organizations in New York. She has a wide experience on the human rights of women and gender issues at the UN system, as well as in the public sector as a whole. Among other appointments, uh, Ambassador uh, Narvaez Ojeda has been the officer in charge at the United Nations Entity for Gender Equality, and the power of UN uh, of women, uh, today called UN Women, in Guatemala in 2022. She also served as social political advisor at the UN Women Regional Office for Latin America and the Caribbean, and regional advisor for governance and political participation between 2018 and 2022. At governmental level, 
She was Minister Secretary General of Government, and she held a number of other high government positions, including as presidential advisor from 2014 to 2016. Ambassador Darvais will be sharing her insights on behalf of Chile as president of the Group of Friends of Older Persons in New York. We will be indeed learning how the group has promoted and supported initiatives in the New York arena and how these efforts could be mutually complemented with those from Geneva. Excellency, you have the floor. Welcome. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me well. Mm. I'm very, very happy to be here. So, Excellencies, dear colleagues, first, let me thank UNITAR for organizing this informative webinar sessions as well as all the panelists and keynote speakers for their remarks. When it comes to the protecting, promoting, and respecting the rights of older persons in the context of the work of the United Nations in New York, I want to call your attention to two UN processes in which the group of friends and member states in general are most engaged in. The third committee resolution follow up to the Second World Assembly on Aging, which we negotiated on a yearly basis for the third committee, and the open-ended working group on aging that for 12 years has been holding sessions in order to strengthen the protection of the human rights of older persons by considering the existing international framework. Nonetheless, the vari variety of issues that the UN headquarters addresses allows for issues related to the rights of older persons to be mainstreamed in the conversations, also in the context of sustainable development. And it also allows to foster close coordination of member states with civil society partners, such as the NGO Committee on Aging, also in partnership with the UN Secretariat, including the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, DISA, and the uh, Office of the Human, uh, the High Commissioner of Human Rights. Such coordination is key to come up with the strategies and build uh, synergies that respond to the actual needs of older persons in an informed manner. The work of like-minded member states that belong to the group of friends of older persons often involves building complementarities and synergies as well as bridging gaps between the discussions on the human rights of older persons. The Madrid Plan of Action, the United Nations Decade for, of Healthy Aging, the Sustainable Development Goals, and the outcomes of the consultative process regarding the new Secretary, General report, Secretary General's report, our common agenda. With regards to this latter report, our efforts point to advocate to ensure that the rights of older persons remain relevant to the United Nations, since it has been presented as the guideline of the priorities and the future of the organization. To this end, Chile, in its national capacity, as well as in its role as chair of the Group of Friends of Older Persons in New York, fully supports and reiterates the importance of the work of the open-ended working group on aging. We are proud to be part partaking in a groundbreaking initiative after this past 12th session of the group in April, launched by Argentina, with the goal of creating a cross-regional cross-group of countries that will evaluate the international normative gaps in the protection of the rights of older persons and deliver recommendations to bridge them, including by studying the possibility of an international convention on the rights of older persons. This is the greatest advance that we could achieve in the matter. We have, we have heard repeatedly from the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, from the independent expert, uh, Dr. Claudia Mahler, and from our civil society partners that there are still considerable normative gaps to protect the rights uh, of older persons and to ensure their autonomy, independence, as well as a life free from violence, abuse, neglect, and discrimination. And therefore, a convention is needed. In its essence, this is also an issue of inequality. For instance, 
while having shrunk considerably the difference in life expectancy at birth between low and high income countries is still around 16 years. We know that rising inequalities across the world is one of the defining challenges of our time. And while inequality has surged to the forefront of political debate at the United Nations, it is shocking that even as we slowly emerge from a global pandemic that disproportionately affected older persons, they remain overlooked in this debate. Additionally, the aging of the population will continue to impact all aspects of society, including labor and financial markets. The demand for goods and services such as education, housing, health, long-term care, social protection, and transport. This is why it's so important to change how we think, feel, and speak about aging, and to challenge stereotypes and misconceptions where older persons can only be beneficiaries or so of social protection. We must recognize older persons as rights holders and realize that the fulfillment of their human rights is a precondition to ensure their empowerment. We must therefore build upon the recent, the recent su success of the first ever substantive resolution on the rights of older persons recently adopted by the Human Rights Council in Geneva and the recent developments in the work of the open-ended working group on aging to push not only for higher visibility of older person in the political agendas and the recognition of their contribution to their communities, but also for their empowerment as active agents of change. Chile and Japan launched in 2020 the Decade of Healthy Aging to foster the abilities of older persons and to promote health by implementing policy measures, including raising awareness about healthy lifestyles and health literacy and promoting occupational safety and health over the life course, which will help ensure that no older person is left behind. With that being said, we look forward to a better coordination of our efforts in New York and Geneva with the support of civil society and the UN agencies and the, and the independent expert towards mainstreaming the rights of older persons in the work we do. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Ambassador. Uh, it's uh, quite uh, impressive uh, to hear the commitment of Chile uh, to this cause. And um, we uh, sincerely congratulate, uh, congratulate you for those efforts and uh, leaving your permanent mission. We will continue now with the um, next speaker, um, uh, Ms. Amal Abu Rafeh, our colleagues from UNDESA in New York. She's the chief of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs Program on Aging at the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. She serves on the Secretariat of the General Assembly's Working Group for the purpose of strengthening the protection of the human rights of older persons, and is a member of the steering committee of the Tickfield City Group on Aging Related Statistics and Age Disaggregated Data. Earlier this month, in commemoration of the World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, Amal was the 2022 recipient of the Rosalie World Memorial Award from the International Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse. Congratulations. In accordance to the Madrid International Plan of Action, our dear colleagues are the focal point on aging in the United Nations system. Likewise, DESA in New York, together with OHCHR, serve as the Secretariat of the UN General Assembly Open-Ended Working Group on Aging. DESA provides technical support to the negotiations of the annual UN General Assembly Resolution on Aging, and we are delighted that our colleague Amal Rafeh has decided to join us today. To you, Amal, our sincere gratitude. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Much appreciated. Um, I think this is a perfect setting to start up with their excellencies and the independent experts setting the scope for our discussions, and I hope that myself and the colleagues who are speaking next can take a deeper dive into that um, conversation. So if there's one thing that we all have in common is that we are all aging. 
And I found from my experience, um, Alex, that people understand this notion easily at the personal level. However, at the policy level, decision makers may not fully realize that global aging is unprecedented, pervasive, and enduring. It's unprecedented because without parallel in human history, the number of older persons is projected to accelerate in the coming decades. In fact, our colleagues in the population division will issue next month the updated um, data, statistics, and projections. And it'll be interesting to see what key messages they come up from that. It's also pervasive because it's a global phenomenon. Virtually, every country in the world is experiencing growth in both the size and the proportion of older persons in the population. And it is enduring because globally, the number of older persons growing faster than a number of people in any other age group. So in eight years, by 2030, which is the target date for the Sustainable Development Goals, older people will globally outnumber youth, and this increase will be the greatest and the most rapid in low and middle income countries, which are not yet ready for this. And by 2050, one in six people in the world will be older persons. And this is why the discussion on rights is important because in my view, it's, it's inevitable to make its way despite the struggle of the uphill battle that we all experience right now to the top of the development agendas worldwide. So today, this data-driven imperative um, is all too familiar, we all know it. And beyond this hype, Right, uh, lies the real challenge. And the first is one that Ambassador uh, Narvez very clearly stated is the issue of, it's in essence an issue of inequality because from our experience, the first challenge is that aging is not currently on the political radar of many member states. Many governments, and for example, in Africa and in the Arab states, remain focused on all things youth um, ironically, these are the two regions that are expected to witness the largest relevant increase in the number of older persons, and we're talking about a rate of increase of 230% by 2050. The second challenge relates to how best to approach aging issues in the UN. There seems, from my perspective, to be a disagreement whether global aging is a development or a human rights issue, and I want to be clear that it is both. Development and human rights inform each other and are mutually beneficial. And such interlinkages, by the way, have been recognized by member states and in the international community time and again. It's not unusual that this distinction or separation is focused on when the real issue is a political one. I heard from colleagues that they had experienced the same thing when advocating for the rights of persons with disabilities, for example. For us, and as you mentioned, Alex, we overlooked the implementation of the Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging. The protection and the promotion of all human rights and fundamental freedoms is essential for the creation of an inclusive society for all ages in which older persons participate fully, without discrimination, and on the basis of equality. By the way, this is text from MIPA 20 years ago that has been agreed and adopted by member states. And having an international standard on the rights of older persons would advance the implementation and the accountability of this plan of action. Because I'm asked uh, to discuss the rights of older persons in the context of the General Assembly, and as you heard from uh, the ambassadors who spoke earlier, you're already aware about the open-ended working group in the General Assembly, and I would underline working. <laughs> um, and the aim of this group, of course, is to strengthen the protection of human rights. Um, the working sessions include, and normally what they look like, is an interactive expert panel discussion. Uh, they usually discuss uh, the extent to which existing policies, policy provisions and practices, as well as legislation, how well do these address the human rights of older persons. And over the years, a newer format of work was agreed upon in which the working sessions engage more in a substantive discussion on specific focus areas. Um, we've covered 10 topics already. The independent expert gave some example of those ranging from, ranging from um, equality and non-discrimination to violence, neglect and abuse, 
um, access to the labor market, access to justice, you name it. And I encourage all of you to go on the website of the open-ended working group. For each of these focus areas, you will find inputs from member states, civil society, national human rights institutions, and the United Nations systems um, that go into detail on each of these topics from the point of view of the rights of older persons. But uh, what, what is more interesting in terms of the mandate of the working group is that in 2012, the General Assembly requested this working group to consider proposals for an international legal instrument based on a holistic approach in the work carried out in the fields of social development, human rights and non-discrimination, as well as gender equality and empowerment of women, taking into account various related processes that take place both in New York and in Geneva, such as you know, the, uh, the Human Rights Council and the Commissions for Social Development and on the status of women, as well as contributions of the review and appraisal of MIPA. And the General Assembly requested the open-ended working group to present to it at the earliest possible date, a proposal containing the main elements that should be included in an international legal instrument. That was 10 years ago, and none of this happened. Even despite the Secretary General for the first time leaning into this conversation at the peak of the pandemic where almost 70% of the deaths of 15 million people were older persons, where he asked member states to take efforts to accelerate their efforts in that regard. Nevertheless, I want to take this opportunity to note that what remains unique especially in the context of the General Assembly, is the truly interactive nature of the discussions that take place in the sessions, engaging representatives from civil society. And in 2017 session uh, marked a landmark event at the working group because for the first time, the United Nations intergovernmental body outside of the Human Rights Council allowed and enabled the participation of national human rights institution in this work. And I look forward to hearing directly from representatives of NHRI and civil society uh, later um, uh, in a few moments. And of course, earlier this year, the 12th session was held. And if you take a moment and imagine that those who joined the discussions at the first session would be now older persons themselves. And while there is global recognition at the session of the particular human rights challenges that older people face, there is disagreement on how best to address these challenges. As with any other issues, there were those who support the convention and those who don't. However, both sides constitute a small number of countries. Most member states are still sitting on the fence. And to be honest with all of you, it is not clear to us if they are neutral or if they are hesitant or if they are still indecisive on this issue. Also, while there is a slow yet steady growth of the number of member states that express openness to discuss the feasibility of a convention, there is a clear lack of firm commitments. Now, Ambassador Narvez mentioned that a, against this backdrop of the lack of political will, a cross-regional core group was set up to help move this conversation forward. And the initiative was supported at the last session by I think 30 member states across the regions. This is great. And we hope that this initiative will allow for increased negotiations behind closed diplomatic doors, which we hope would accelerate front channel discussions and announce positions at the 13th session next year. And as I conclude, Alex, I wanna re-emphasize as I always do, that I believe that ensuring the full and equal participation by older persons themselves is crucial because their perspectives and experiences in identifying what are the challenges, the opportunities and the solutions should inform and support all these efforts. I thank you for your attention. We thank you, uh, Yaramal. Uh, this update, uh, for lack of a better word, is critical. And uh, indeed, we take note of it and we are committed uh, to support the process in any possible way. Now, uh, to continue with this um, unique panel, 
Allow me now to uh, introduce uh, Ms. Sabrina, Sabrina Carl, the co-chair of the Group of Friends of Human Rights of All the Persons in, Geneva's, in Geneva at expert level. She represents the permanent mission of Slovenia to the United Nations and to other international organizations in Geneva. She is also responsible for a wide portfolio of human rights issues, including the human rights of all the persons. She dedicated the entire period of her early career to the United Nations, with several years as a project manager at the United Nations Association for Slovenia, and also at the Slovenian Youth Delegate, um, as a delegate to the UN. The composition of the group of friends on the human rights of all the persons in Geneva is different than the one in New York. This group was launched in 2016. They promote and support initiatives on the human rights of all the persons, including through resolutions and the UPR, the Universal Periodic Review process, and look even further into possibilities to complement efforts that the international community is making at the UN in New York and Geneva. With that, it is my great pleasure to offer Ms. Sabina Cardi the floor. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for passing me the floor and for organizing this important and timely discussion on aging and the human rights of older persons trying to bridge uh, the Atlantic, um, the, the ocean between New York and, and Geneva. I'm delighted to participate at the event today as, as you already pointed out, the human rights expert at the Mission of Slovenia, who is co-chairing the group of friends of uh, the human rights of older persons uh, in Geneva together with Argentina. As you know, Slovenia is a really strong advocate of uh, when it comes to aging and the rights of older persons. In New York, our diplomats have been serving in the Bureau of the Open-Ended Working Group. We are also part of the New York Group of Friends of Older Persons under excellent leadership by Chile. And we joined the core group that has recently been established in, in the framework of the Open-Ended Working Group. While my country is also actively engaged in the work of the UN Human Rights Council, substantive resolution on the human rights of older persons addressing ageism and age-based discrimination and approved by consensus with over 50 co-sponsorships last year. I will today focus on the work of the group of friends in Geneva, the, the very operational aspects of what we do. First of all, I wanted to point out that we are a multi-stakeholder uh, group. It is our sincere belief that we can only achieve real progress in the field of human rights when we work together. And it is, of course, true that the UN and UN processes are, it have this strong intergovernmental nature. But speaking at least about the Human Rights Council here in Geneva, it is only when uh, the member states, the civil society, uh, the UN, other international organizations, the NHR, NHRIs come together that we really reach the best solutions and advance human rights the furthest. And in that spirit, the group of friends in Geneva is actually consisting of both member states, the representatives of civil society, we are joined by some of them today, representatives of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the relevant special procedures, of course, the independent expert on the enjoyment of all human rights by older persons. Um, we engage in a number of activities all with the goal of advocating and mainstreaming the inclusion of aging and older persons um, across the, the UN, especially the Human Rights Council in Geneva. The group of friends, therefore, I would say has three main tasks. Firstly, it's a group of support for the mandate of the independent expert on the enjoyment of human rights by older persons. We engage in frequent conversations with the mandate holder, um, Ms. Claudia Mahler, we invite her as a speaker to different events, present joint statements and at the interactive dialogues, um, commenting on her reports. We support the core group of the resolution on the extension of her mandate. And here I can already share, I can already disclose that a new resolution, a next resolution on the extension of the mandate is uh, coming up um, at the upcoming session of the Human Rights Council in September and October 2022. Secondly, the group of friends serves an, as an amplifier of the human rights of older persons and a tool to mainstream uh, the rights 
acts in different uh, documents, in different resolutions across the work of the Human Rights Council. Uh, we exchange information about different um, initiatives and we seek ways to emphasize the role of older persons in different texts before they are um, tabled. Very often our members are actually the pen holders of the resolutions and this is when we already um, see the stronger language reflected in the first drafts of the resolutions that are usually addressing other issues. We have recently engaged strongly on, for example, a resolution on the right to work, uh, which is uh, one of the rights that is highly relevant also for older persons and the end result was that with in cooperation with the core group the resolutions language has been strengthened in this uh, regard here i would also like to mention another uh, another tool that the group of friends is recently has recently started to engage on and this is the universal periodic review with the start of the fourth cycle of the upr in uh, november this year we see a new opportunity to strengthen the mainstreaming of the rights of older persons uh, through the universal periodic reviews um, and the, the group of friends is planning its activities i would like to use the opportunity today to already reach out to uh, any of the uh, non-governmental organizations civil society representatives that might have tuned in for today's event and ask you for your partnership on this uh, it would be of a tremendous value if we could hear especially those who are working on the grounds in different uh, countries that are being reviewed in the universal periodic review each time ahead of the UPR review. The group of friends would uh, really value uh, information and collaboration uh, in this regard um, and we will also soon be sharing uh, our activities in the framework of the fourth cycle of the UPR. And thirdly, finally, the group of friends um, serves as a space for discussion, how to strengthen promotion and protection of the rights of older persons, and look even further into possibilities to complement efforts that are being done uh, both in New York by the international community um, at the UN in New York and here in Geneva. This is through public events, support of the events that are done by our partners, by the civil society, uh, through joint statements, uh, bringing together bringing on board new let's call them champions having informal conversations investing into awareness and education about this matter where we often also just connecting the dots in our capitals in new york as an eu member state i can also say in brussels and here in geneva so to summarize the group of friends is basically a multi-stakeholder group of human rights of older persons champions, an amplifier and promoter, uh, a mainstreaming force, and above all, an open space for discussions on the way forward in this field. And with this, I'm ending my intervention, but I'm happy to answer your questions or engage further in the discussion about the group of friends. Thank you. I'm uh, giving the floor back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, to Ms. Uh, Sabina Carly. Uh, for um, uh, this uh, thorough explanation on the group of friends and all the work that uh, she does. It's a pleasure to have you here now. Uh, we will continue with the proceedings, and now it is my great pleasure to welcome another colleague, Mr. Rio Hada, the focal point on the human rights of all the persons of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Rights uh, OHCHR. He's uh, currently leading the work of uh, the High Commissioner uh, Office on the Human Rights of Older Persons and serves as the Joint Secretariat with DESA for the Open-Ended Working Group on Aging established by the General Assembly with the mandate to strengthen the protection of human rights of older persons. In 2020, he coordinated the drafting of the Secretary General's policy brief on the impact of COVID-19 on older persons. Over the last two years, the Office of the High Commissioner has undertaken a major initiative to analyze the normative and protection gaps in the enjoyment of all human rights of all the persons and to develop options to address such gaps. They have produced a working paper in 2021 and a report of the High Commissioner presented, was presented to the Human Rights Council in March 2022. The Office of the High Commissioner also actively collaborates with UN partner agencies such as WHO 
and UN FPA to support the implementation of the UN Decade of Healthy Aging 2021-2030 and the mainstreaming of human rights of other persons in the world of the UN system. It is a pleasure uh, to have our colleague uh, Rio Jada with us. The floor is yours, Rio. Welcome. Thank you, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to participate again in this excellent initiative by UNITAR under the UN Decade of Healthy Aging. Um, I'd like to start by going back to 10 years ago, back in 2012, soon after the Open-Ended Working Group began its mandate, our office prepared an analytical paper on normative standards in international law in relation to older persons as our contribution to the work of the uh, Open Data Working Group. That paper looked at the gaps in the international system and it formed discussions at the working group that led to many developments, including the establishment of the mandate of the independent expert by the Human Rights Council. But after several years, we saw the need and, and demand for updating the study and to look deeper into ongoing efforts to strengthen the human rights protection of older persons, especially through um, existing mechanisms like human rights treaty bodies. So with support of Austria and Germany, we produced an updated study last year, which was submitted to the Open-Ended Working Group. And I'd like to highlight a few, just a few points that emerged from this work, which are also captured in the report of the High Commissioner um, that was submitted to the Human Rights Council this March, pursuant to that uh, Council Resolution 48.3. So one is the recognition that there have been progress in some areas in advancing the rights of older persons. Certainly the developments under the regional mechanisms, and of course the mandate of independent expert. But that progress does not really measure up with the extent of gaps that we are seeing, which became amplified in the COVID-19 pandemic, both in terms of norms and standards, as well as the protection of older persons in reality. Second, when you look at the current international human rights framework, as well as global policy frameworks such as Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging, although the progress in some areas they have not quite delivered on its promises to stimulate more focused and comprehensive action to better protect the rights of older persons and to raise the accountabilities of those actions or inactions. The international human rights treaties have done that in many other areas, women's rights, children's rights, disability rights, engaging national governments and civil society and stimulating that focused actions at national and international level. But we have not had that quantum leap in relations to the rights of older persons. So we draw two conclusions from this. One is that there are inherent limitations, conceptual and practical with existing mechanisms. We actually need a significant different approach and ultimately a new dedicated convention will be the most effective way to bring about that quantum leap. And this was seen clearly in the case of CRPD, as well as other conventions addressing specific groups. Second, at the same time, we found that there is a need and a significant scope and opportunities to improve the existing system's performance, notwithstanding their limitations to better integrate older persons in state party reports, shadow reports, uh, list of issues, and ultimately in recommendations. I think the next session of this unit of web webinar will focus on EPR and other mechanisms on how we can better utilize uh, the existing systems. And it's encouraging to hear from Savina that a group of friends in Geneva is committed to strengthen the integration of older persons in UPR processes. Uh, because right now the uptake on older persons is very, very low. It's quite surprising that despite the growing number of older population, age discrimination addressed by treaty bodies, for example, account for less than 1% of all recommendations regarding discriminations. I think this is part of ageism that we all need to tackle. Having said that, there is an increasing awareness 
For, for example, some time ago, we looked at the number of recommendations for UPR and treaty bodies and compared them before and after 2011, the year when the Open Internet Working Group was established. And there is a difference, an increasing trend, certainly due to the mandate of the independent expert, but also in recent years, there have been more attention to older persons. For example, in the council, which held panel discussions on older women, on the impact of climate change on older persons, and last year with the first thematic resolution on human rights of older persons. So following this resolution, OSHR will be organizing a multi-stakeholder meeting on 29th and 30th of August to discuss the findings of the report of the High Commissioner. And um, importantly, the meeting should come up with proposals and recommendations on the way forward, including to strengthen synergies and actions between Geneva and New York, among stakeholders and among generations. So we look forward to your continued active engagement. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, dear Rio. It's um, excellent to have uh, the Office of the High Commissioner being represented today by you. And thank you also for giving us uh, this uh, holistic uh, report. Let me continue with the panel. And I would like to invite now Ms. Anna uh, Xaviera, a member of the group of experts on the rights of older persons advising the Polish Commissioner on older persons issues. She also represents uh, Endri and Gangri Working Group on Aging and Human Rights of Older Persons in her role as Vice Chair of the Working Group. She is a sociologist and a senior specialist in the Department of Equal Treatment in the Office of the Commissioner for Human Rights in Warsaw, where since 2011, she organizes social research on discrimination based on grounds of gender, disability, age, sexual orientation, ethnicity, and beliefs. Her tasks include also monitoring the state's policy on aging and the works of the UN Open and the Working Group on Aging. Uh, we have uh, the pleasure of having you now, uh, Ms. Xaviera, and I would like to offer you the floor. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me today as a representative of national human rights institutions. Um, I would like to start with a um, few words about who we are as national human rights institutions. And I would like, yes, thank you for the slide, first slide. Um, as uh, very often there, there is somebody in the audience who is not very much familiar with it. Um, so national human rights institutions are state bodies, um, which are mm, constitutional or with legislative mandate to protect and promote human rights. And the standards for nature rights have been endorsed by UN General Assembly in 1993 and are known as Paris Principles. And there are a few, as you say, lines um, of, uh, which describe us more. I hope you will receive this presentation. So if somebody is more interested, can, can read it um, thoroughly. But now I would focus on this uh, line, which is in bold, which is nature rights assist their state to meet its international human rights ob obligations and provide advice so that international human rights standards are implemented at the national level. Um, please, ne next slide. So, and how we cooperate on at international level. So to provide, uh, how does it look like? Uh, so we are associated in four regional networks. So you can see that there is a network for Africa, Americas, Asia Pacific and Europe. And uh, of course also at the global level, and this is GANRI, so Global Alliance of National Human Rights Institutions. And if you will click on the link later on, you can find if in your country there is a national human rights institution. Very often if you have an ombudsman office, so this could be a national human rights institution at the same time. So, and now GANRI is composed of 120 members, which will um, uh, matters later on, as you will see, which uh, 90, 90 of them have, um, hold A status. So they're fully compliant with the standards, with the Paris principles, so they're independent, they uh, issue the recommendations for governments and so on. And 30 are of B status accredited in HRIs, which means that they partially compliant with Paris principles, but very often they are also very active on the field of 
protecting protecting human rights um, and also human rights of older persons. Next slide, please. So, and I really like this Ganry the theory of change, which is a little bit something about the mission. Um, so Ganry sees it like that with and through its members, um, uh, Ganry positively impacts on human rights globally when, and there is again more to say, but I will focus on what is in bold. And NHRIs can speak with unified voices and influence the global policy agenda and NHRIs contribute towards a world where everyone everywhere fully enjoys their human rights. Among those, um, everyone are also older pers persons. Uh, please, next slide. So, and within this gunnery, uh, so this global alliance, we have also working groups. And one of them focuses on aging and human rights of older persons. And as you see, we have representatives from, from each region. So from Africa, America, Asia, Pacific, and Europe. Um, there are also more NHRIs involved, not only two from each region, which is the official representation, but there are more of us. And this, in this, with what we are focusing on, it is, uh, our activities at Open-Ended Working Group on Aging and Human Rights Council. So how we can really influence this process and um, what to do to make the voice of older persons, voice of uh, civil society organizations uh, heard better through also our expertise and uh, um, the knowledge what we gather during our everyday work on national level. Next slide, please. So last, uh, last year we uh, focused on, uh, um, during the last um, session we, uh, of open-ended working group, we were also there. And uh, as some of you may know, uh, open, uh, national human rights institutions can take the floor at the session, OEGA sessions since 2017. And what we are focusing again, we are really calling for a new convention on the rights of older persons. Uh, we submitted a number of written statements and oral statements, and it matters to be there and to speak up to, uh, uh, to what really matters for, uh, from the perspective of human rights. So, uh, and now you can see why I uh, told you that Ganri consists of 120 members because at the last OEGA session, there were um, at the at the previous session uh, in 2021, the 12 NHRIs registered and nine NHRIs were active. And at the 12th session, so this year, 25 NHRIs registered and 14 NHRIs were active. So there is really uh, space to um, improvement. And I, I really would be grateful if you would check uh, if your national uh, human rights institution is already involved or if you can talk to them also and, um, uh, and make them more engaged. Next slide, please. Uh, can I ask? Yes. Just, just very shortly, please have a look if your country is here because there are the countries which were uh, NHRIs from those countries were active during the last OEGA session. Uh, I will count to four and then I will please for the next slide. So next slide, please. And why it's important to be aware for, for NHRIs also that the process is um, going on in Geneva and also in New York. So from Geneva, we took, you know, we, we take the uh, information on on substantive resolutions. So we work as a, with the resolutions as a tools to indicate our governments uh, what's there and asking them how they're going to implement it. So we're making it also more visible for, for the audience on national level. But just as an example, uh, here's the link for the ENRI statement. So you can have a look at, at, at it later on, uh, which was presented during 49th Human Rights Council session, which was just a month before 12th OEGA session. So we, as an ENRI, uh, exactly that was uh, Ombudswoman of Croatia who presented this uh, the statement, asked 
uh, member states. What progress do member states foresee in the process at OEGA, so in a month, and how to the outcome of, of upcoming OEGA session will concretely contribute to the drafting of a new binding convention on the rights of older persons? So, of course, we are just one um, voice or many voices among many others, but still, uh, we present ourselves as your partners in this process of gaining and the new convention. Next slide, please. So what would NHRIs need to better protect human rights of older persons also on national level? It's clear, clearly, we need a new binding convention on the rights of older persons as at the beginning I mentioned that uh, that is exactly NHRI, that NHRI assists their state to meet its international human rights obligations. So therefore we need a convention also for human, for, for, for us as experts and those who produce recommendations for governments to, to, to know the standards, to have the standards in one document. And before that, we really need collaboration with NGOs and states on national level. And also NHRIs should be aware on the ongoing debate and engage in this debate as I hope really, and I believe it's really important that NHRIs should be included, mentioned in a new convention as monitoring bodies, just as it is in convention on the, uh, uh, for, of the rights of person with disabilities. But it's still, uh, we hope that it will be there. Uh, next slide, please. So just thank you. And if anybody would like to uh, have more information on that uh, or uh, suggest some contacts for of other NHRIs, please contact me later. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks to you, uh, Anna. Uh, very good uh, and, and appreciated that you have invited National Human Rights Institution to actually uh, be mobilized and galvanized and get included and up to date. Much appreciated. Now, um, we have, um, of course, a, a also a representative of uh, civil society. And um, I would like to now introduce her, uh, Madame uh, Silvia Perel Levine or Levan, Chair of the Subcommittee of the Human Rights of Older Persons of the NGO Committee on Aging in Geneva. She has been advocating in the fields of human rights, aging, and health for 23 years. She represents the NGO's international network for the prevention of elder abuse, IMPEA, and the International Longevity Center Global Alliance, ILCGA, advocating for the inclusion of aging and older persons across the UN, and promoting for a UN Convention on the Rights of Older Persons. There is no doubt on the important role and active participation of the civil society's organizations to advocate for the rights of older persons, and we are very pleased to have uh, Sylvia with us uh, here today. We will be uh, learning uh, of their efforts, not only in Geneva, but as well in New York. With that, uh, dear Sylvia, it's my pleasure to give you the floor. Welcome. Thank you, Alex, and it's a pleasure to be here with you all among friends and, um, and many that are watching us. And I probably will repeat some of the things that have been said already, but um, I think that it's good to repeat the main, <laughs> the main messages. And yes, I am here as civil society and um, as part of the NGO Committee on Aging in Geneva, and also the NGO committee in New York was mentioned, and there is also an NGO committee on aging in Vienna. That is, we have NGO committees on aging, um, committees of NGOs with an interest in older persons and in the rights of older persons in the three headquarters of the UN. So each of one, we focus on the processes that are based in this, our cities, but we also interact and cooperate as we all advocate for greater inclusion of older persons and aging across all the UN. We consult and coordinate our respective activities, for example, around the International Day of Older Persons. And this year, and in 2022, on 1st of October, International Day of Older Persons, we focus on the resilience of older persons in a changing world. And Geneva will focus on older persons as active agents in a changing climate. And this is taken from what uh, the independent expert mentioned that we need more focus on, um, on climate change and looking at the position of older persons as we are not only <laughs> recipients or um, 
really suffering the consequences of the climate change, but also we are active, age, active agents and also fighting together with the youth in, against climate change. And in New York, they will focus on the resilience and participation of older women, and also the independent expert mentioned the importance of focusing on older women and the resilience and the, their participation as the intersections of the discriminations that we see between gender and age are very important. So we do, we consult, we participate, we do this together, in, co in cooperation with um, UNDESA uh, for the IDOP, but also with member states. We all advocate for the full enjoyment of our rights in equal standing with everyone else. Uh, we advocate for a human rights approach with our meaningful participation. And this is what I want to bring here, that many of the things, <laughs> the activities that happen among member states or in the UN, they don't always have our meaningful participation and they should. So when we talk about building the bridges between New York, Geneva and beyond, it's also across the silos. And it's also we want to engage and be included in all the processes. We have, it's not that we are not included in anything, on the contrary, we have made a lot of progress. And I want to just mention a few examples where uh, civil society um, participates and really advocates for older persons. For example, the Agenda 2030, there is a stakeholder group on aging, the SGA, that as part of the major groups and other stakeholders, that is a main interface between the civil society and the UN system on the issues of sustainable development issues. While we don't have a particular goal, a sustainable development goal on aging, really we make sure that all the other go goals do include the life course approach that also Claudia Mahler mentioned. We are not talking just about older persons or young persons, we are talking about ensuring that the whole life course is included in all the processes. So then, and we also submit um, oral and uh, written statements and papers for the high level political forum and the related processes. And another example is the urban agenda with the general assembly of, of, of partners. Um, habitat, and there is a constituent group on older persons also raising the importance of the urbanization in the lives of older persons and the active participation of older persons at the local level. Um, but also the regional fora on sustainable development, for example, the UNECE regional civil society engagement mechanisms that they also have a specific group on older persons, or the global alliance for the rights of older people GAROP, which is an umbrella network of over 300 local, national, regional, global NGOs promoting a convention on the rights of older persons. Our rights do not expire with age. We have the right to participate in all spheres of life. And we also have the right to care and support that respect our autonomy and independence. We want to be equal partners, to have a say and be heard, to have a platform to get redress from the human rights violations and discrimination we are subject to simply because we are old. So we mainstream knowledge on aging and we also mainstream human rights in all aging activities at the UN and in countries. So we are working together to change the narrative together. A UN convention on the rights of older persons that every, all the speakers mentioned can guide the governments to design and implement human rights-based policies. So yes, the NGOs from Geneva and New York especially, and Vienna as well, we participate in both different, but with different levels of inclusion. Both New York and Geneva have groups of member states, friends of older persons, as both we have representative uh, both from the ambassador of Chile in New York, and we heard from Sabina in, uh, in Geneva, and we participate in those meetings, and we are really, we, as Sabina said, I want to <laughs> stress what she said, that the work together, and that the fact that we participate, 
also strengthens the work of the member states, strengthens the level of the resolutions when we help them with language. Because we, the human rights mechanisms, include civil society in deliberations, negotiations, and also in drafting. So we are consulted on language, we propose language, we help. We propose language that strengthens those resolutions as she gave the example of the right to work, but also we participate in the resolution, in substantive resolutions on the rights of older persons. And if we are not consulted, we can also propose and participate at negotiations. We are, we can invite ourselves to the table at the Human Rights Council, and we do so. So we ensure that we, in civil society, we consult with each other in order to bring and try to bring a unified voice to improve and to strengthen the rights of older persons. The open-ended working group requests our inputs, and we would, would like to have an adequate time to contribute, which sometimes is not really the case, but we do contribute. And we would like to be more included in the draft resolution, resolutions of the third committee too and on any informal group that may be discussing our issues. We want to be invited to the table, to all the tables. While intergovernmental bodies are indeed bodies for governments, I would like to quote myself at the last of the working group when I said, we are here, there, and everywhere. And we need to be part of any process, particularly those that directly affect us. So we need to ensure that any process that deals with older persons includes us in Geneva, in New York, in the national, regional level too. We are here to help, to work with the government, to strengthen their work and to work with the UN agencies too. So any interagency group on aging should invite our representatives to the table too. If the UN is a standing working group on aging, that meets in Geneva, includes a seat for civil society at its bureau. So we know it is possible. So let us formalize our participation. Let us formalize the promotion of the rights of older persons beyond the goodwill of individuals and more than a few paragraphs in GA resolution. The substantive work at the Human Rights Council that was mentioned, including the reports by the independent expert, the reports by the high commissioner, the, on the normative standards, the multi-stakeholder group consultation that will follow in August, and the conclusions that will be presented at the 51st uh, session of the Human Rights Council or in last next March uh, session, will hopefully not stop there. We need a substantive resolution on the rights of older persons to become a regular human rights feature every other year. We need to build up the agreed language and increase the participation of all the persons in the process. And this is something work that happens on the Human Rights Council and all the other human rights mechanisms must be and can be more prominent in the work of the open-ended working group and the General Assembly and lead to the realization that a convention is the way to truly advance our rights with a formal committee and a proper forum to discuss our rights and the implementation of the, those agreed commitments with a much needed accountability. We, civil society, communicate well across the Atlantic, across UN agencies, and across regions. We need the formal commitment of governments at all levels and across all silos. Let us sit together at the planning and decision making table, and we need the support to ensure that older persons can in fact attend and meaningful participate. Member states, it was all mentioned as well about the UPR and the a, a voluntary national reports at the high level political forum and the civil society should sit at the tables in the countries to help provide the inputs to those reports that member states will present, whether it is at the in Universal Periodic Review or whether it is in New York at the high level political for, uh, forum. And I will end there. I think the message is clear. We work with member states. I think that the member states present here can attest to the fact that we are 
helping, that we improve the work, that we can work together in order to advance our rights. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, uh, Sylvia, for that uh, passionate uh, uh, reminder uh, that we couldn't agree more with. Uh, civil society has to be uh, seated at the table at any single instance, and of course we support that. Now, uh, we have uh, just a few minutes to go over with some questions. The first two questions that I would like to present are to Ambassador Gallegos and to Ambassador Narvaez. Uh, first with um, His Excellency Ambassador Luis Gallegos. The question goes as follows, if I may. It says, uh, from your wide experience in the multilateral arena, more than four decades, uh, having served as an uh, ambassador in New York and in Geneva several times, what do you think are the main differences um, that, uh, between the perspective of the topic in the New York and the Geneva ecosystems? What are the main differences on how this topic is seen in these two cities, UN cities? Excellent. Thank, thank you very much, Alex. Um, my, uh, my perception is that uh, I, I think these are meetings that are very valuable to coordinate and look at the perspectives from, uh, different, uh, from different areas. Uh, I think that uh, we have mentioned some, some issues and I would like to underline two strategies which I find extremely important. One, uh, I, I think that uh, Sabrina Carly said, uh, said it very well, and so did, uh, so did Rio. Uh, we need a strategy in the human rights field, in the Human Rights Council, to advance this, this issue uh, with the UPR. As, as the beginning of the UPR session in September begins, we have an opportunity to ask every state member uh, during their UPR sessions, which is a revision of all the state members of the United Nations to the UPR, uh, their, their stance on the on a UN enforceable convention for aging. I think that uh, that strategy uh, will work with, the, uh, with a cooperation between state parties as friends of aging, uh, the, 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 uh, the civil society, and of course the agencies. Uh, I, I do believe that that is an, an extraordinary strategy to move this issue that will garner the possibility of taking it then to, to, the, to the third committee uh, to ECOSOC and to the General Assembly. My, uh, my impression having uh, been to meetings both in Geneva and in, in New York is that as Sylvia said, the, there is a vitality in the, in, in, in the human rights organizations on this issue. Uh, we, we see them work coordinatedly. Um, I was impressed uh, uh, negatively in the last meeting of the working group because I saw a lack of participation of member states. At the best uh, meeting, uh, we had something like 90, 98 uh, countries and then they leveled off. So the, the, the issue of ma making this a priority issue, and I, and I agree with uh, Her Excellency Paula Narvaez, this is a, a fundamental issue, how we can get a critical mass of countries behind the initiative of a UN enforceable convention. So I think the, the objective for all of us should be how we can get more members of the United Nations to, uh, to uh, collaborate with us in asking for a working group that will draft, not, not, and I'm not speaking about the actual working group or if it's done inside that or not, I'm, I'm saying the mandate to negotiate a convention. And I think that we are, are advancing very nicely uh, with the help of the Human Rights Office, I think that Madame Bachelet has been extraordinary, as has been the Secretary General. I had the honor of speaking to both of them on, on these issues. Uh, now, my, uh, my principal uh, underlying uh, objective in answering this question would be to say that there is a complementarity between Geneva and New York uh, with deficiencies on both sides. Because I, I sometimes ask myself why countries uh, have delegations in New York and Geneva that don't speak to each other or that don't maintain their, the same position. I think that, that instruction has to come from their capitals in order to be very precise on what the position of the state is. Uh, and on the other hand, I think that it is, it, it is very valuable that we have a human rights perspective uh, born in the, in the Human Rights Council with a resolution, a strong resolution, the UPR strategy to take it to New York. Uh, I, 
will tell you that from my experience in, as, as chairman of the uh, negotiation of the, US, uh, of the CRPD, we ran into the same problems. We ran into the, 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 the Europeans who were doubting how to, how to engage. I think we are moving into a more favorable zone with the position of Germany and Austria. I think we have to get more countries than the ones we have now, which are basically Latin Americans, uh, to, to, to aid us in the position of making this a reality. Uh, the objective would be uh, in a chronology to in, in the next 36 months to have that decision made uh, and have the number of countries to negotiate a treaty. I think we have to put a chronology and date lines to that chronology and have uh, as any program a strategy date lines to the, to the work we have to do. So I would suggest that be part of the discussion we have uh, with, with all the interested groups. And uh, as the president of GIA, uh, we are more than willing to collaborate in any way we can with all the, all the stakeholders uh, in this endeavor. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to you, Ambassador. And uh, indeed, let me echo what you say at the end of your comment. Uh, we appreciate that you are here uh, leading us and hosting us as the chairman of the Board of Trustees of UNITA, but also as the president of the Board of Directors of the Global Initiative on Aging the foundation, um, a not-for-profit organization created under the Spanish law um, last year. So thank you all, on behalf of uh, both organizations. We appreciate your, your leadership. Now, to Ambassador uh, Narvaez. Ambassador Narvaez, um, you have an impressive experience when it comes to championing issues of uh, gender uh, and the advance of women. You have been a presidential advisor, a, um, uh, very many things, including minister, secretary, uh, general of uh, government of your country. So the question that we have received, uh, I think is fitting with your previous um, experience, uh, senior experience. The question is, what can the world do to actually advance older persons of, uh, sorry, yeah, to actually what female older persons rights. So from the perspective of the advancement of women, can you give us some comments on how to empower female older persons? Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, relevant conversation that we have had here today. And if we are um, doing the linkages between different aspects of, of, of this situation, I think that gender, as, as you mentioned here today, and aging is absolutely related. But we need uh, here, uh, I think, uh, an important cultural uh, change to face and to 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 face this uh, this uh, this problem or this situation or this dimension uh, of human being. So this cultural change uh, should be translated into public policies as well, because we have here recommendations, we have here resolutions that are very very important, but we need to also put the focus on the capacity of uh, implementation of these resolutions in a very concrete manner within the state. I also have the experience in my country to work very closely with the institution of uh, older persons, the public institution, the Senama institution in my country. I work as a presidential commission of the, the very beginning of the, institu the public institution on these issues. Um, and and, and the, the thing that I saw there in that uh, experience was first the political will for the, uh, the, the authorities is absolutely necessary, fundamental. Secondly, the necessity to put into practice the public policies. And thirdly, but not necessarily in that order, but the involvement of um, civil society organizations. This is critical, this is crucial, this is fundamental, because you need to engage with those perception visions on how we address the, uh, uh, the elder situation of, from their perspective into po a public policy. Um, and there you can see that the most of the people that participate from the civil society are women. Women are who are you know, pursuing this agenda more and absolutely more uh, uh, 
in a more outstanding manner. So I would like to rescue the, um, the experience from a women's perspective and from women uh, uh, situation and link that with the uh, elders uh, agenda. So, and also because the differentiate impact that different situation has, have also should be uh, see from the perspective of, of, of women as well. So that's one of my, you know, top of mind uh, reaction to your to your question. So civil society, gender involvement, because women are who are the, mo the most important actors here, political will uh, and the implementation of the resolutions and different international instrument that we have but that we need to be very, very sure that they can be translated into the concrete policies at national level as well. Thank you, Excellency. Very well said indeed. Um, and that uh, should be a roadmap and a priority for all of us now. Um, uh, to Dr. Mahler, uh, I'm going to accelerate because we, are, we have only seven minutes now and we have received very many questions. We had around 70 participants from, I believe, more than 15 uh, or 16 countries. So we're very happy, uh, by the way, uh, we will produce a video uh, with the material that is being recorded and we will widely disseminate that. Normally we get hundreds of views on YouTube and several other platforms. So it's important to, to wrap up with this question. So to Dr. Mahler, the linkages between SDGs, Agenda 2030 as a whole and issues of aging. Can you give us some concrete opinions from your unique vantage point on how everything that is being done on the rights of, the, of older persons should be uh, contributing, seen as contributing to the SDGs as a whole. Floor is yours. Thank you so much for these important questions. I think from my perspective, the first thing should be try to check your indicators. Do your indicators include all the persons in the different topics? If not, please make sure that the indicators go for the whole range of aging and not stop at a certain age of 55 or 65. Make include disaggregated data in these specific issues and give us the whole picture. Um, also raise awareness, as was just mentioned, all the women. This year we focus in the high level political forum on the SDG and you can include here quite clearly also the perspective of all the women in this regard. So thank you so much. I think I just stop here, but uh, we can see this in all the different aspects, for example, poverty, include old age poverty, especially with a gender specific aspects or intersectionality. These would be my recommendations make sure that all the persons are included, not left behind, and part of your data which you provide for the high-level political forum and for your implementation on the national level. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to you. Uh, let me now, um, I don't know if we have Amal uh, with us uh, uh, still, um, uh, but uh, yes, we do. <laughs> there is a very specific question on um, uh, the hesitance uh, uh, to say uh, this diplomatically of some member states to actually adopt a position. Can you tell us in a succinct manner what must be done so member states actually come to the front uh, with any position, but uh, how uh, can we mobilize them to you? Thank you so much, Alex. I think we need two things. We need a good quality thread and we also need um, we need a good, sorry, I'm just connecting my phone to a charger. <laughs> my computer did some updates. And we need also good quality duct tape. And allow me to explain why. Good quality threading is because member states and different stakeholders should come to understand that when we promote the rights of older persons, we're promoting also the rights of today's youth who will eventually be older persons today's working uh, uh, populations who will be older persons, today's women who will be older women, including the Secretary General's discussions in, her, in uh, our common agenda report, future unborn generations, because they are also projected to live longer lives. This conversation of longevity should be part of our threading. Uh, more than half of persons with disabilities worldwide are now over 60 years old. So 
that thread that connects these social groups is still missing. So when a delegate in New York is talking about um, women or persons with disabilities, still older people do not come straight to their mind. So that's why that thread is needed to connect these things. And strong duct tape, because I have to say from our experience with member states um, in New York is that we've managed several times to throw a hook and it attaches to put the rights of older people at the top of the discussions um, and political agendas, and then immediately it falls down. Older people are still not at the forefront of the thinking of member states, and we have to use that duct tape to close these gaps and to make these issues stick. It uh, requires a lot of uh, nonstop um, efforts, um, and, and especially from older persons themselves. I think when they speak directly to delegates, it has a very different effect from when we uh, attempt to speak on their behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Amal. Let me go now to Silvia. And before I present the question to Silvia, quite interesting to read um, uh, one of the comments uh, from the participants, uh, someone from the name Francis, that says, while civil society are involved and can make notes, quote unquote, civil society organizations are not always invited to the table where decisions are taken, as you say, Silvia, and we recognize that. And of course, uh, we at the UN have the commitment to bring civil society all along uh, in the most inclusive of processes. Now, we did receive all the question, I'm going to read it to you. It says, considering the active participation of civil society from all regions, more and more, is it easy to find a common position or is it difficult? To you. Yes, I know. <laughs> I'm thinking about the answer. I think that the more and more people will come to the table, it will be more difficult to have common positions on specific issues. But I think that the mass of support for the general idea that we need a, 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 that we need to protect the rights and that we need a convention, I think it will be strengthened. So we do need to enrich our discussions. And of course, I agree with Francis. I mean, and I said it, <laughs> that we are invited to the table sometimes. We are not always invited, but we should make sure that we are invited. And the issue of the participation as well, and at the regional level and at the country level, that there is a lack of capacity. And I think that UNITAR here can play an enormous role in increasing the training and include and, and bring older persons to learn what their rights are. Part of our problem is that many older persons do not know yet that what the rights are. They feel sometimes that it, their time has passed and we need to challenge that. We need to challenge and to, and to really insist that this is a world for everyone. And we are here until we die. And bringing more and more will strengthen the work, the work of everyone, even if it may make it more difficult in agreeing language. But it will, at the end of the day, it will strengthen everybody's work. Indeed, indeed, it, it is. It is the only way, no matter how difficult it gets. But we, we, we are to speak with one voice and find common ground. Now, let me go to Rio. And I know that I'm uh, kind of running because we are running out of time, but uh, Rio gave us several things to think about. And I think it's very important to present the following question to him as well. It's, it's, it's about the, the Human Rights Commission of the Third Committee in New York. It says, how can we complement better the work of the human rights uh, with the discussions hold in the framework of the third committee, third committee in New York. Rio, please. Yeah, you're muted. Sorry. Um, I think Amal um, captured well when she talked about the complementarity between human rights and, and development. And they are uh, both goes hand in hand together. By the way, also together with the peace and security. These three pillars of the United Nations are interlinked and needs to be upheld together. Um, and unfortunately, human rights is often seen as more controversial and somehow um, neglected subject. But I think 
the United Nations systems are changing. And I also wanted to um, say a little bit more about the UN system in the sense that uh, we, the, the, the COVID-19 was also an opportunity for many of the UN agencies to come together um, and, and discuss and elevate the priority attention to older persons. I have seen uh, many much, much, much more joint actions um, uh, take up from the field and the de decade of healthy aging is a good example uh, of how UN agencies coming together um, and also trying to um, bridge the divide between different committees of the GA um, and, and the Human Rights Council. And by the way, beyond the General Assembly and the Council, we also need to better understand the dynamics and entry points to mainstream aging and rights of older persons in governing bodies of different UN agencies and organizations in WHA, uh, in UNDP, UNICEF, UNFPA executive boards. So um, someone once said that you know, the coherence or incoherence of the UN system is also a reflection of the, the reality among the member states. But I think at least within the UN system, I think we are all committed under the charter objective of the human rights. And that's the uh, way that uh, it should be for everybody involved in the UN discussions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rio. Excellent observations indeed. Now, the, the last two questions. Uh, uh, to Anna first, I, I don't know if Sabina is still with us, but uh, Anna, if I may, let me read uh, from the floor. It says, have uh, national human rights institutions considered this topic as a cross-cutting element when it comes to periodic reports in the framework of human rights binding instruments? I'm not sure if I got the question. Could you repeat uh, once more? Yeah, absolutely. Have a national human rights institution consider this topic as a cross-cutting element so that it goes uh, across, it's transversal, right? A cross-cutting element when it comes to periodic reports in the framework of HR uh, human rights binding instruments. Uh, if I'm getting it right, so it's like why in the mm, new instrument we need to have this human rights based approach as a, I'm, I, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I got it. I'm sorry, I'm not here very well through the network, but let's, let's put it this way. I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, as NHRIs repeats frequently that human rights based approach should be included uh, in in the debate on the rights of older persons and in the documents which regards uh, older persons. And without this human rights based approach, we will not go nowhere because this is the crucial point on 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 the debate. It is not about particular fields or right to education or right to um, health from different perspective we can consider it. But when we look through the lenses of human rights, then we see the person in the center and everything which regards the person, it's, uh, um, then it comes on the place. And the new convention would provide us with this, I hope that I got it right, cross-cutting perspective on, the, uh, on this, uh, in this regard. I hope it's yes, clear you, enough. Yes, Sorry you did. yes, you did, because indeed it is um, uh, transversal. Uh, just to give an example, Ambassador Gallegos uh, mentioned at the, at the beginning, um, uh, all these niches, uh, it, it does it apply in a transversal manner to people with disability, persons with disability and aging, older persons with disability, uh, or female older persons, as Ambassador Narvaez say, or the things that you just mentioned, indeed. We have to ensure that holistic approach that I'm not sure we have achieved yet. It, it's coming but there's still a, a lot more to do with this transversal view. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, very good answer indeed. And if we don't have uh, Sabina, uh, I know that she was on the move. Oh, we do have Sabina. That's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Sabina, I had actually um, uh, received also a question uh, for you. So let me read because we're running out of time. It says, how is the interaction, its frequency 
between the groups of friends in Geneva and New York? Is it a frequent engagement or is it a, a rather slow? I wouldn't mark it as frequent and I wouldn't mark it as slow. Uh, the reason for that is that mostly the delegations need to speak to their own delegations in New York and Geneva. So um, these are the, the connections that are most frequent. Uh, usually the human rights experts from Geneva would be connected to their 3C colleagues who are normally engaged in the open-ended working group. These connections are, of course, not without flaws. I think one of uh, the previous speakers already mentioned maybe some uh, misinterpretation of the instructions from the capitals, but it has to be understood that the topic as such, aging, and then the additional la layer of human rights of older persons is also such a multi-sectoral uh, topic that it's actually addressed by a number of ministries. Um, it's not only the case of Slovenia, but uh, when I speak to my colleagues, it's the ministries of uh, labor, family, social affairs, then it's the ministries of foreign affairs trying to navigate through the international um, arena, then very often it's the ministries of finance that has a big say in the in the positioning so um without without uh, pointing any fingers it's it's a discussion that includes a lot of actors a lot of stakeholders that need to have a say in the final result um i can say for the, the sake of today's discussions indeed that the link between New York and Geneva can always be strengthened. It's, uh, it's never as strong that it couldn't be more frequent and, and more strong. And maybe if we can use this workshop today as, a, as an um, impetus to do so, I'm happy to uh, facilitate the link. Thank you for the question. Indeed, to you, to you, Sabina, to you, uh, dear speakers, uh, uh, our appreciation, but we cannot close. Uh, unless I do something that uh, we normally do in support of our colleagues at WHO. To anyone listening, to all of you dear participants, remember the UN Decade of Healthy Aging is also for you, regardless of the age that you have. We invite you to be an active part of this decade. It was created, of course, to cover the period 2021 to 2030. It's a global collaboration. It's aligned with the last 10 years of the Sustainable Development Goals process until the year 2030. The idea is to bring together governments, civil society, international organizations, professionals, academia, the media, the private sector, and most important, you, so we can improve the lives of older people indeed, but also their families and the communities in which they live. Populations around the world are indeed aging at a faster pace. We have to remember that. and. Um, this demographic transition will uh, have an impact on almost all aspects of society. Everything is changing and we will have more people above the year, uh, the 60 years of age than people that are born as of now, as of this year. Already there are uh, more than 1 billion people aged uh, 60 years of, or older with most living in low and middle income countries. Many do not have access to even the basic resources necessary for a life of meaning and of dignity. Many others confront multiple barriers that prevent their full participation in society. Um, and we don't have to tell you how the COVID uh, pandemic affected uh, disproportionately in 2020 and 2021, all the persons, and this problem continues. So we invite you all to read about the decade uh, on aging, to join your forces and your voice to make this a better world. We have to join forces and we have to have a unified voice. With that, I would like to, on behalf of UNITAR, thank all of the speakers for giving us their time today. And remember participants, uh, this is a series of events. If you have already um, registered for one, you will be invited for the next. Uh, our colleague Ana Lucia Jacome has just put on the screen the next uh, third, fourth, and fifth event. And to conclude, I would like to also express my sincere appreciation to her and to her team for doing an utmost and excellent job in bringing us together. To all of you uh, that have listened until the end, our respect and our appreciation, we wish you well. And with this, this webinar is concluded. Thank you very much, goodbye.